Hi there. Today I want to share with you a, a very special episode. It's a little bit uh, shaky video and the audio is kind of off, but it, it's an older message I preached at Sunrise Baptist Church uh, that I want to share with you here today. It's a message about being a godly mom in an ungodly world. And uh, you know, today ladies are... Uh, not treated like they should be, uh, and to be a godly lady is something that is uh, honestly looked down upon by many in society. The thought that she would uh, take care of her children, that she would uh, love them and, and provide for them. Uh, a lot of people today will tell you that holds them back, keeps them uh, from fulfilling their own uh, dreams and wants. And Reality is, uh, if it wasn't for the godly mothers and the godly ladies in the churches, I don't know what we would do. I tell you, I believe sometimes the churches would have been closed if it wasn't for the ladies stepping up and uh, providing uh, the things that only they can uh, to uh, the ministry of the church. Uh, so uh, I want you to listen closely to this and, uh, and hear what God's Word says as we look at the story of Hannah uh, from the Old Testament. D.L. Moody used to tell a story about a man around the turn of the Mexican War. I don't know if you know what the Mexican War is, but it's in the 1800s. It's right why we have most of the Southwest uh, now in the United States. But uh, the man, uh, he had left his testimony with him. And the man said this, When the Mexican War began, I wanted to enlist. My mother, seeing I was resolved, said if I became a Christian, I might go. Uh, she pleaded and prayed that I might become a Christian, but I wouldn't. I said, when the war is over, I'll become a Christian, but not till then. Rebellious spirit was even back in the 1800s, you know. All her pleading was in vain, he said, and at last, when I was going away, she took out a watch and said, my son, your father left this to me when he died. Take it, and I want you to remember that every day at 12 o'clock, your mother will be praying for you. Then she gave me her Bible, and marked out passages, and put a few different references in the flyleaf. I took the watch and the Bible just because my mother gave them. I never intended to read the Bible. I went off to Mexico one day while on a long, weary march. I took out my watch, and it was 12 o'clock. I, I had been gone four months, but I remembered that my mother, at that hour, was praying for me. Something prompted me to ask the officer, to lead me for a little while, and I stepped behind a tree, and out on those plains of Mexico, I cried out to the God of my mother to save me. God saved that man, is what D.L. Moody said. And after the Mexican War was ended, uh, he said, I have enlisted again to see if I can do any good for my master's cause. Let me tell you what, if it wasn't for the godly women standing in the background propelling some of the great marches of God, we wouldn't have the great marches of God, okay? You men who think the women are maybe a little lower in the church, let me tell you what, they may be a little higher than you, okay? Because they take the hand and they rock the cradle that's going to change the world. You hear me? So you better think well of your wives and your mothers. God saved that man, and he can save souls here today. Um, you know, if you think about it, when I was in high school, the enlisters would come in and, uh, they, you know, they would gather around. Uh, they were even there when I went with, the other day with Matthew to go to the college enlistments. And they were over the side, and they want to talk you into getting in that army. You know, they want to bring you into that army. Why? Because they need people to fight in that army. And it ain't very appealing to say you're going to a place where bullets are going to be flying over your head, right? That's not an appealing thought. Uh, but in the same way, mothers are a hundred times more effective. And what I want to talk with you about is the story of Hannah today. I want to talk with you about her and how being a godly mother is an oddity in the culture we live in, but it's a necessity, a necessity. So if you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel, uh, that's in the Old Testament, uh, about six or seven books in, in 1 Samuel and chapter 1, and I want to begin by reading one verse that this godly mother avowed that she vowed. 1 Samuel 1.11. As you find that, if you'll stand for the reading of the Word of God. And it says, speaking of, of Hannah, 
And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, now, I want you to see first of all about this godly mother Hannah. That if you're going to live and be a godly woman, a godly man, and especially a godly mother in this culture, you're going to feel all alone sometimes. Now look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says in the first verse, Now there was a certain man of, and you'll hopefully I get this right, Ramath Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, Elkanah of Mount Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. That's a mouthful, ain't it? <laughs> and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. Well, that was easier. And the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his surly yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now you hear there a lot about this man, but this story isn't at all about this man. It's about this woman here in this first chapter. It's about this woman named Hannah. And when you first read that, you may think, well, what's all this? He had two wives? Didn't God say that was kind of wrong? You know, to have two wives, that's something called polygamy. Uh, some people mistake uh, that polygamy is, is, is condoned in the Bible. It isn't. I've always wondered about polygamy. I, I think it may show the intelligence of men and women. It seems that men always have the two women, but women never have two men. They know better, right? <laughs> they don't want to do that. But uh, that, that, that's the thing. It, we see that over and over again what happened in the Bible. The Bible, uh, polygamy is not condoned by the Bible, but it simply reports uh, what was taking place during that time. It, it even regulates it, but it never condones it. And it always shows there's trouble as a result. As you'll see here, these two don't get along. It don't, it don't work well when you've got two wives. They don't like each other because they're, they're jealous and there's fighting and, and there's all sorts of trouble. Uh, Jesus settled that issue for everyone. He said in Matthew 19 that uh, back in the beginning, it was one man and one woman, right? Not two, one man, one woman, two people. So he settled that forever. To get past that though, Hannah here, her name meant favor. Well, Panana's name, name meant a ruby. And, and, and Ruby here, Panana, uh, she absolutely hated Hannah. She made her life miserable because Hannah was the favored wife. He was the one, she was the one that, 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 uh, that this man loved, and he only got Panana on so he could have some children. Now you think about that. Throughout this, we, we hear about this man. How would you like to be the second choice? You know? We brought her in only because she can give us a child or two, you know? And she's kind of over here on the side. So she's constantly attacking Hannah because she can't have children. And here you've got this husband. Oh, what a great husband is that. I think I'll go get me another wife so I can have a son. Who's your ideal husband, I hope, ladies? Uh, but that was the kind of guy this was. So, so here Hannah. This godly woman, she has this strange situation for a husband. She has this woman who's with her all the time who hates her and, and troubles her constantly. And now I want to tell you a little bit about her, her religious life and the priests that were over her. You might imagine, I mean, today is the preachers who were over, uh, over her when, when she went down to the temple. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. And Hophni and Phinehas weren't good preachers. They weren't good priests. As a matter of fact, these were the sons of Eli. In 1 Samuel 2, 12, it tells us that they were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. So the preacher didn't even know God. He was the son of the devil. That's what Belial means. So these two down here, not only were they like this, uh, their dad Eli was the older priest. It says in, in 1 Samuel 2, 2, now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did to all Israel. And how, listen to this, they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They were fooling with the women who were working within the congregation with them. They didn't know God. They were out here uh, committing fornication. So, so it's kind of hard for this lady to live a godly life when she thinks her preachers are adulterers and adulteresses, are adulterers, and her, her uh, only lady friend nearby hates her. 
And her husband actually goes into another tent with another woman every once in a while. It's hard to live for God, isn't it, ladies? It's hard to live for God. And you think the culture is bad now. It's the same way now, isn't it? There's bad things like that happen all the time. And it may be even harder for the younger generation because there are things coming in on them that wasn't on you when you were older. The culture was different. And now it's just all drawn over into absolute wickedness. All around us. So it's hard to be a godly woman in an ungodly culture, isn't it? It's hard to be a godly man, too. And, and a woman who lives in a godly, is a godly woman living in an ungodly culture, she'll feel the need to pass that on, right? Look down here at verses 4 through 8. He says, And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penana his wife and to all her sons and daughters portions. So he gave them something to eat. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. He gave her a little bit more because he really loved her. Uh, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for, to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Ain't I hot? Ain't I great? Don't I make it up for it, baby? No! <laughs> no! Funny when you hear it in the modern vernacular, isn't it? But, <laughs> but that, that, that's what he was saying there. So, so here's this lady... And she's going through this terrible time. And he says, why are you so grieved? Because God had instilled in her heart a desire to pass on that God-given trait within her. To live for God. She wanted to pass that on to someone else. The world's going to tell a woman, go out. You don't need to do those things. Go get your career. Worry about yourself. Worry about yourself. Don't worry about everybody. Else. Don't worry about them kids. Listen here, I want to read you some of the, there was this website I went to this week, and it's called Mike, uh, I guess you speak your values, but it was talking about ladies talking about having children in our generation and what that meant for them. Now listen to these, these quotes, it says, it leaves your body, right there is wrong, right? It leaves your body? It leaves your body and it costs twenty to $30,000. I've I have $40,000 in student loans already taking up the rest of my life, and that's the best case scenario. If anything goes wrong, double it. That was her idea about having a baby. There are too many unwanted kids on the planet as it is, so I don't want to bring more into the world. I'm adopting if I ever decide I want kids. People don't understand how bad having a large population is. What? I joined the zero population growth movement a long time ago for environmental reasons. I think we need more doers and innovators compared to repopulators. The physical changes my body would go through with the pain of birth is not appealing to me at all. Well, I guess that's understandable. It, it overwhelms me to think that there would be a tiny little person growing inside of me depending on me to make healthy choices. Children have always irritated me to no end, this lady. The only time I enjoy children is when they are quiet, humble, intelligent beings. I always hear this in a British tone. Obviously, these conditions are unreasonable to expect of the tiny humans. So for me, the logical solution is not to have any of my own. When I imagine my future, I just don't see any kids. I love what I'm studying, and I want to get the most out of my career, whether that includes endless overtime, sleepless nights, relocating, and or travel. With the way I want to live my life, kids would get in the way. Now, you know what? I thought about that when I thought endless overtime, sleepless nights, relocating or travel. She can have all that with a child, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I don't want kids because I just don't. I shouldn't have to explain my reasoning or even have a reason all my body, my choice. Now, this was one of the most encouraging responses I heard. She said, I can't have kids naturally. It's not a sad thing, though. A lot of other women get upset when I tell them that, but I just say I really have no right to complain about one gift I didn't receive when I've been given so many to begin with. You can hear she knows there's somebody who gave her a gift, right? Right? And that reflects our scripture. And modern women may find it hard to grasp the burden of the phrase that was said there, the Lord shut up her womb. 
We live in a society today when, when many young couples just have decided not to have children. It's just common now. In ancient society, though, uh, to be barren was to fail the family. It was even considered by some to be a punishment from God that you, you'd be a barren woman. Hannah's sense of failure was heightened by Peninnah constantly aggravating her and, and taunting her about her condition. Now, in today's world, we're in a totally different scenario. We've got Bill Nye the other day uh, saying that we ought to put an extra tax on people for having extra kids in the developed world. Children aren't a heritage from the Lord, uh, according to the world today, right? Uh, that's how they look at it. Uh, a world in which both birth control and abortion are widely promoted. It's often sponsored by our government. It's hard to, for, for people to identify with the sense of failure and the lack of fulfillment that Hannah would have here. Her, her story here is a reminder to us that the world is full of people who feel inadequate or incomplete for one reason or, or another. But she had this burning desire to pass her life on to someone else. She wanted to pass that on. And let me tell you what, when you pass that on, that godly life, that, that truth of Jesus Christ onto someone else, it doesn't pass by just by genes. Y'all hear me? Just because that you went to church every day of your life does not mean your child will go to church every day of your life automatically. It don't just happen that way. It's not passed on through your genes. It's passed on through your lifestyle. There was one mom, one mom who relaxed every day by reading her Bible. And after her child had observed this habit for several years, her four-year-old daughter, four daughter walked up to her and finally asked, aren't you ever going to finish reading that book? <laughs> right? You see, you've got to be an example all the time. Not just part of the time. Why did she have that book in her hands? Because so she wanted to see what God had said. And then that four-year-old child's eyes, they see that's important to mom. What's important to mom? What's important? Is it the iPhone? Is it, is it the shopping channel? Is it the money? What's important to mom? What's important to dad? Well, what's important to you? If you could go up to your child and ask them this very morning, and they were very honest with you, what would they say is important to you? Think about that. Because it's not passed on by genes. And so Hannah wanted to pass this on. It was her desire. And so she went to the only one she knew who could give her any help. Her preacher wasn't going to give her help. They were fooling around with the women in the front door. Her, her husband wasn't going to help. He's too worried about, hey, baby, I'm great, you know. And, and, and her, uh, her uh, other lady in the house, she sure wasn't going to give her no help, right? So, so she went to the one who she knew always would give her help, and that's to God. Look at verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. And now Eli was the priest, sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. She was crying out to God. And she vowed a vow, like we said earlier, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look at the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. I'll give him to you, Lord. Just let me have a child to pass this on. And it came to pass... Well, I won't get to that part yet. I won't look at this for a minute. When you have a need, do you ask God for it? I want to ask you that. Ladies, men, when you have a need, do you go to God to ask for it, or do you feel you got to do it yourself? There's a lot of times, there are people so proud that they won't come to an altar and pray. You know why? Because then somebody would think I was uh, failing somewhere. And you know, I don't fail in nothing, right? Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not behind in anything. I'm not doing anything wrong. Somebody might think that. And then, no, I can't go ask for Help from God? I couldn't do that. We all need help. There was a school teacher who was correcting papers and she was looking over one little boy's work one day and she went through it. She went through it. And she said, you know, I fail to understand how one person can make this many mistakes. And the little boy jumped up almost immediately and said, well, I, it wasn't just me. My dad helped too. <laughs> 
He helped you out. You, you don't go through life on your own, do you? Now, now, sometimes they might lead you in the wrong direction, but for most of the time, they want to lead you in the right direction, don't they? They want to. The parents want to lead you in the right direction. But here she made this vow unto God. And so she made this vow unto the Lord. She says, I'll give them to you. That means she's going to have to give them up in a minute. Can I tell you something? When you seek to walk with God and you seek to raise your children right in, in, in a wicked culture, you're going to be misunderstood. They're going to think they're weird. They're strange. They're not like everybody else. Look here at verse 12 through 18 to give you an example of that. It says, And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. That means she was watching the words coming out of her mouth. He was watching her move her lips. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, so she wasn't even talking out loud. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. That old drunk woman come here and start praying. And Eli said to her, How long would thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy hand made for a daughter of Belial. Let's remember that's a daughter of the devil. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Well, go in peace, and, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Now, you, let's, let's, let's think about this for a minute. You ever notice how the rest of the world works? If a Christian gets in trouble, oh, it's coming down on them, isn't it? Everybody's going to say something. Everybody's going to have a, have a point about it. But they never seem to realize that when they're pointing the finger, there's at least three more coming back this way, Right? Now, what did I say about old Eli? What was his sons doing? Sleeping with the women at the front of the church? They, they didn't even know the Lord. And here he is coming up on this godly woman and saying, you drunk woman, get out here. I'm, I, I'm so self-righteous, you need to leave. Isn't that the way that sometimes people are? That they, they become so self-righteous in their selves that they can't, see, they can't see the truth. They can't see reality for how it is. And the world... No matter how good you are, even people in the church may think, what's wrong with them when you're trying to live and be a godly mother? So when you live in this world like this, you expect to be misunderstood. Expect to be not understood like everybody else. But the hardest thing to end with for a godly woman is this. One day, she has to let go and give it to God. Hannah gave that child over. 24 it tells, and when she had weaned him, back in 1 Samuel 1, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one epaph of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli, this priest, this one priest. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Little Samuel. She went up every, day, every year after that to the temple. She made him a little coat every year to give to him after that. The hardest thing about being a parent is one day you have to let the child go. But mothers, you're handing them off to God if you've done it right. You're handing them off to God. Folks, we're passing something on to the next generation. This is bigger than me, you, anybody else. This is God's great plan. And God has blessed you. He's blessed me with three children. He may have blessed you with others. Let me tell you what, if you have no children, you're in Bible school, we might have a whole lot of people pick some out. <laughs> pick some out. But folks, God gives a grand mission. Are we willing to accept it? Let's sing it. Let's get a song. We've talked about this all, all throughout this service. Now's the time to come to Now's the time to lay the burdens down. Maybe you need to help. Don't, don't, don't be foolish. Be like Hannah. Come, give it out to God.
I hope you are enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I am blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.